who had created Donald Trump, Karen? Did we, we in the media, there have been all sorts of studies, we at NBC have covered it more than any other network. Um, are, we, are we promoting this? Are we covering a story that should be covered? How much is it the media's fault for Donald Trump? Oh, it's a story. I mean, we have no choice but to cover it. And uh, I think Donald Trump created Donald Trump. And, you know, it's right now it's his world and the rest of us are just living in it. Um, it's a huge world. <laughs> it's huge. Everyone tells me. That's right. Um, but, you know, it's, it's some, there, was a, there was a little bit of hand-wringing in the media at the, at the beginning of this phenomenon as to, you know, and we had, you know, various outlets, uh, Huffington Post saying, oh, we're going we're gonna to put an entertainment tag on this, not a political tag. But that doesn't mean they're not covering it as much as they were. Again, he is a vessel for something that is going on in the Republican Party. He is a vessel for something that is going on in this country. And I think it is absolutely appropriate for us to be trying to figure this out. Peter, should we be new snobs? Um, I agree with Karen that I think we were in the beginning. Um, I think there, she, she's right that there is a mix of things going on at one. There, there's just this really deep-seated anti-establishment passion in the country that he's tapping into. Um, and two, there's just an incentive structure in the political process of 2015 and 2016 that rewards, you know, big talk and uh, controversy and gaffes, and we in the media cover it. Um, and I think there is a there is a level. Can we cover it or give him too many tools to. I mean, he is, expose he is, it. <laughs> <laughs> we give him the opportunity. Uh, you know, we live in the digital era. He's got his own tools to do it too. Um, I just I, I think that there is a there is a strain of thinking in the in the political media that um, you know the process is better than this, but that's not true. Like yeah. the the campaigns have always been about personalities and gaffes. And uh, not issues. Mama, not where's substance. my pa? Right. right. Yeah, that was, um, that was in the 19th century. I, I don't remember that. That's all right. <laughs> <laughs> um, I got a laugh from did. Dan Balls, though, yeah. I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, we should be covering it. We absolutely should be covering it. Um, he's leading the Republican polls. Um, he's tapping into something out there that's actually very real and has been you know, uh, in the bloodstream for many years now. Um, and it says something about the GOP, absolutely. Connie? What about the progressive movement? Should they learn from Donald Trump right now? <laughs> we just, I think the progressive movement is enjoying watching this play out. You know, I'm, by the way, I'm not with the plane dealer. I'm nationally syndicated with creators. And I, I just want to make sure I'm sure the plane dealer. I know you from the plane dealer. Yes, yes. right. Um, well, being in the battleground state of Ohio, I love saying that, uh, uh, where no Republican has ever won the presidency without winning Ohio, and only two Democrats ever have. Um, I find it interesting as a columnist, a liberal columnist in Ohio, watching what the progressives are saying, but also watching what a lot of um, conservatives in the middle of the road, because I run a public Facebook page. I have about 135,000 followers. I recognize many of you in the audience here today from my page. Thank you for that. Um, but as you know, those of you in the audience, we have a lot of conversations every day, and many of them are about politics. And the thing I, I, I'm a little concerned about as a member of the media is this room is exceptional in that you already care what's happening in the presidential race. If I could cite one mantra that keeps surfacing in any discussion about any candidate, it's why are we doing this so early? Why does anybody care yet? And I think for a lot of Ohioans, Trump is really at best entertaining. Uh, he's insulting for a lot of people. But I also, it was interesting watching the first panel, I think it was, I don't think the Democrats can take Ohio for granted for a second. When Hillary Clinton won the primary in Ohio in 2008, she won with a lot of white working class males who suddenly, I do not believe, became feminists. Um, they were not voting for a black man. So this field is wide open here and there's a lot of work to be done in Ohio. You know, Kathleen, um, Chris had said something about, um, about the, the, the new media that we live in, the culture that we live in, meaning that it, it's sort of how quickly we cover these things. I saw a tracking poll, and I'm not, it was an online tracking poll, I'm not crazy about it, that Reuters does, but it was interesting to me that Mike Huckabee, the week he made his oven comment about the Iran deal, about leading Isra Israelis mm -hmm. to the oven, he went from 4% to 11%. It, uh. it meant that it, 
that it was he was rewarded. He got more coverage than he had gotten in two months. Yeah. I mean, are we creating a re it, 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 like I said, it, 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 uh, Peter just put it. I'm sorry. I have a good friend of mine named Chris Hamby, and I always call, uh, always call not related. Chris, so my my apologies, <laughs> Peter. Um, do, if we are, is our media culture now basically this is how you get well, coverage? Yeah. <laughs> yes. I mean, if you say something that's newsworthy, you're going to get coverage. Um, but I would like to go back to the other question for just a second about the, about Trump. <clears throat> it's all connected. But, you know, I think actually that Donald Trump was inevitable in a weird way, you know, because we are with this, this blending. Of the person or the idea? The idea, because he's not a person. No. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, my favorite theory, a friend of mine said he's actually Andy Kaufman. Yeah. <laughs> and it, someday he'll rip his mask off, and it's been a 25-year hoax. There you go. Anyway, he's, just a, he's a great big idea named that, called Trump, and, and you know we're all in Trump world now. But, but basically, yeah, what I'm saying is that when you we've we've sort of merged the worlds of of celebrity and politics and entertainment, and if you were going to feed all those into a computer, those facets of our culture, I think it would spit out Donald Trump. You know, it would be like Beetlejuice. You know, kind of. <laughs> suddenly just emerges in full living color. Um, but, you know, as to whether we participate in that, there's just no possible way we could ignore Donald Trump um, as he is now the front runner. You know, he just simply has to be covered. Um, initially, I'm, I'm not so sure. There might have been some, an argument for, um, for just... I, you know, he's, he's a huge personality. I just did a, I just was talking to some media from Australia, and they're here to do Donald Trump because he's known all over the world. He's a big deal, and when Trump does something, it's a big Trump thing. Uh, so I, I think we do participate to, the, so to some extent, but I don't think we can be blamed for Donald Trump. And, uh, but, we, but, but the I, press has such agency, though. Like, we're not yeah. just dispassionate observers of this campaign just Why, standing back like wait we, a minute like think why why aren't we dispassionate observers? i still fight to try to be a dispassionate observer i think uh, you you were one of the good ones i think karen but does the real, the oh, reality I like is, you fight to be a dispassionate observer yeah, but i also think that the nature of the media today you bring up the mike huckabee thing i mean he said something that was designed to do exactly what it did but the nature of the media today the different channels is that with Twitter and everything else, it tends to make small things look big and big things look small. True. It's, and so you can get that bump. You can, and it will suddenly look like it's, you know. Someone's always going to cover it. the world. Yeah, Matt, Matt Rhodes, Romney's former campaign yeah. manager, always said, a link is a link, right? Whether it's from Red State or you the New York Times. didn't care where it was from. BuzzFeed. It hits Twitter. It takes off. Game you over. Did any of you don't have to leave your office to run for president anymore? Donald Trump is sitting in his office in New York orchestrating this entire thing. It's very early. It, it, did anybody see the National Journal story? I think it was earlier this week. You know, it's late compared to 08, though. So the reporter trying to set up an interview with serious questions for Donald Trump, mm -hmm. and he could not get the interview. That is so instructive but, but in I would, this moment. But however, my colleague David Farenthold at the Washington Post did the same story. And the fact is, maybe Donald Trump didn't sit down with a National Journal reporter, but David Farenthold took all of his public utterances. And yeah. I mean, it isn't like that guy is not sitting down for a lot of interviews. I, ca I can't get away from him. Well, I was just going to say, and in fact, <laughs> and this is something, and, I, and I, I don't, you know, the media's role in this, but Trump is taking what McCain did in 2000. And he's taking it to another level. He doesn't say no to anybody. I've been tough on him. He'll come right on. Oh yeah. He I doesn't don't think that's going to play well. How I, long can he keep that up? I, I will be. I think we're all going to be feeling a little silly in about two months from now. Is my guess that we had so I much. I was where you were a month ago. I don't know if I'm there. Anymore. I, I just don't. Well, I guess I'm. I'm not talking to. I'm talking to voters a lot and talking to regular people. I don't mean you aren't. I just mean I hear from them. I'm easy to find and I'm accessible. So I'm hearing from them a lot. And most people, certainly in this state that I, who are paying attention at all, want to start having some serious discussions about issues. Nobody tonight, unless I missed it when I stepped out to get Mike, has talked about what's happening with Planned Parenthood, for example. And that is an enormous issue. And if you want to talk about health care, a lot of people in this state, the hundreds of thousands who now have coverage, want to know who's going to lose it if you're going to take the coverage away. Who with the pre-existing condition? It's interesting you bring up the Planned Parenthood thing, because I think there's an aspect of this story 
that I wonder if we're going to hit to another level, which is this idea that the, uh, the ends justify the means type of ad political advocacy, right? This, was, this is a designed political hit right. Right, on Planned Parenthood. This is sort of like, we can't win the fight this way, we're going to try to win the fight another way. And other advocacy groups will try to do the same thing. It's sort of the, it's sort of the, um, you know, in the environmental movement, right? You had, you had very environmental, you know, activists that said, no, let's chain ourselves to things, let's fight. But those were those were publicity stunts designed to get media attention. Now it's create your own content, put it out there, and we're forced to cover it. But, right. But I predict the question you're going, one question you're going to hear tomorrow night, in some form or another, and it may be the raise your hands, will be, would you shut down the government to defund? Planned There's Parenthood. No doubt that question's going to and, and they, you know, everybody in the Republican field has just, just gone to DEFCON. Oh, I, I agree. My column I just filed, and I said, at least, you know, they've been really early this time. We know exactly where they stand on women. They don't care. And what I don't understand is That's why we keep true. casting this question as a women's issue. If you love any woman in your life, shouldn't you be caring about our health? If you care about how the country is run, don't uh, you I, want us, to, the women folk, to be strong and sturdy? Oh goodness! <laughs> I, I, Unfortunately, we won't we won't hear from the only woman in the field tomorrow night because Fox has decided That's that right. well, they're only going to have ten of them, right. which again is the media uh, picking and choosing winners. And you say it's but early, by the way, but it, well, you want to get me started on this? Yeah, go. Let's say NBC News <laughs> had the let's say NBC News had the first debate. Let's say NBC News decided which ten were going to get in and which seven weren't. What do you think the conservative uproar would be, Mr. Hamby? Uh, just a little bit. Just a little just bit? A little. It is amazing that Fox has decided to just deem who's first tier and who's second tier. It, it, is, it is actually ridiculous, especially this early when candidates are depending on right. this kind of attention to raise money and make the kind what of would comments What would you have done with 17 candidates, them. Kathleen? Well, what would you have done? You cannot put them all on the stage. Why? Correct. Why? Because it's, well, Dan Baltz just wrote a story from New Hampshire where they had all but three on, on the stage. And you had essentially, uh, it was a cattle call. You had a minute to say, hi, you know, I'm Jeb Bush. And, you know, it has a very minimizing effect also on each of these individuals. But it's minimizing people like Rick Perry and no, Lindsey Graham I terrible, who are really capable a, people who aren't allowed on the debate stage. There's a different way to do it, perhaps. But Bloomberg came up with another formula that considers all kinds of other factors, not just where they are in, in the polls that day. So what, we want to do sabermetrics yes, to decide? I, I mean, it was more interesting to <laughs> Money me. Money balling. Just, okay, you're, you're, nobody knows who you are yet, so we're going to make sure they really don't know who you are. No, I think it's terrible, <laughs> yeah. but I don't know how you manage it. And Baltz's conclusion was, what was obvious is that you couldn't possibly have all those people on stage and have a debate of any value. I mean, now they're... The already. only thing I can think of they could have done is just split it into two. Well, hey, two nights. Debates. Just have two nights, by the way. And random. Cable. Random. Make sure Trump's on the second night, right? So you don't like lose. No, I mean, you build it up. You be a programmer, right? Why not? Yeah. Um, I want to go to the role of social media because everybody wants to figure it out. Peter, you have to be our expert here. Uh, I te I'm teasing you about Snapchat, but this is, everybody's going to want to dub this election something, right? You know, if 12 was, you know, uh, I guess, oh, oh. 2008 was more of a Facebook election. 2012 was a little more of a Twitter mm -hmm. election. What is this going to be? Is it the sort of the idea of always on journalism, always on campaign? You get to come in at any point in time and watch it when I you think, want? I think the appropriate thing, if there is to be a moniker, is the mobile election. Mm -hmm. um, you know, four years ago, people spent less than 1% of their daily screen time, television, computer, whatever, on mobile. Now, it's 30% of your day. Um, what will it be next year? Forget, like, probably in the ele exactly, actual election year. 30, 40. Um, again, not to, not to shamelessly plug something like Snapchat, but 60% uh, of U.S. smartphone users between 18 and 34 are on Snapchat. That is where young people are wow. living right now. Yeah. Um, people are watching 3 billion videos a day on Snapchat. Um, and a lot of us in this room are like, what, what is Snapchat? I don't get it. Um, I'm happy to do explainers for everyone in the lobby afterwards. But <laughs> go ask a, a kid at Ohio State if they have a TV in their dorm room. Guess what? They don't. They don't know. They, ask them when the last time they watched CNN, NBC, read the Washington Post was. I don't know. But they've probably seen the content. Yeah. They <laughs> yeah. just don't know. On Facebook, right. they don't That's know. That's what I mean. Right. They don't know where the content is. Right, right, right. right. Um, so the larger point is that... Um, you know, with Snapchat specifically, this is a young, kind of hard-to-reach audience in an increasingly fragmented 
media ecosystem, even more so than when the Obama campaign pioneered targeting. Um, so it, it, is, it is just phones are where people are living now. Think about your own behavior and your own, your own phone use. Um, so it's becoming incumbent upon campaigns to meet people there. And so we should do the same? Yeah, I think so. How has it changed? How you get? You've been a political reporter and you, you, the, for for a long time um, through many technologies. And I I love them all in that they everyone is another way to get information into people's hands. But what I mourn is the degree to which it has made it possible for the candidates to put themselves at a remove from us. It is so. It's like all the candidates are under shrink wrap these days. You, you rarely see a, a, an extemporaneous reaction to something or, you know, a, a real sort of authentic answer to anything. And so the challenge for us, and it's getting harder and harder, is to come up with ways to write about these people that are surprising and that tell you something about them that you already didn't know from the nine videos they put out today. Right. You know, Connie, I had one of my great fears that the unintended consequence of the 47% video was going to be that we would never hear a candidate utter anything remotely interesting ever again. Well, since we've seen Ted Cruz wrap bacon around a gun, <laughs> I, should, I think uh, you could, your fears could be put to rest. Yeah, We're gonna but was see, that interesting? No, uh, was, was that like telling about what they think about the role of government? That's what I mean. I would say, sure, that revealed quite a moment for me to watch that, him do that. If to he eat thinks, bacon off a gun? And to be leader of the free world, thinking that was the way to get there. But I, I agree with you on this, that the, but you know what that video also tells you? that if you're not going to let media cover these candidates, you're going to have your citizen journalists, you're going to have your attendees at different events, they're going to start doing it and they can download it. To, you know that from Well, this happened with Snapchat recently, actually, you'll like this anecdote. Um, we have local stories running in a variety of cities around the country 24-7. And it's all user-generated content, right? So they submit to the story, we curate it and push it out. One of the curators walked over to me a few, like a month ago in New York and said, Hey, Peter, uh, we got these snaps coming from Hillary Clinton in Chicago. Can you come take a look? And it turns out she was in literally a closed-door fundraiser at a hotel in downtown Chicago, and some donor was just snapping away. And she didn't say anything. I watched all of them. She didn't say anything 47%-ish in there, right. but someone will, and well, someone will catch Hillary it. Hillary Clinton. She no. no one <laughs> but that's, this goes to Karen. This, this, I mean, between what Karen just said about shrink wrap, Kathleen, and... My fear of how, the, how every candidate now, 47%, it's so calculated. What is our role anymore? If we, can, yeah. if we can't puncture it, how are the average, how's the average voter supposed to be able to puncture this? Well, the average voter probably has greater access to those moments than we do at this point, you know, when, as people are traveling around. But I've noticed that people are kind of, don't you think these candidates have become a little bit kind of hysterical almost? I mean, the bacon around the gun, you know, the smashing of the phone. I mean, what were some of the other antics? I mean, it's just... The yeah. Oh, yeah, chainsaw, the, the chainsaw, chainsaw, the tax it's code. Kind of like, that was really impressive. I thought. I mean, it's it's really kind of uh, cutting through paper. I don't know. It says something <laughs> tough, terrible about where we are just as a culture because it, I do think now that everyone can be a star, everyone can be the star of his or her, her own movie, everyone can be the citizen journalist, anybody can get media attention by doing something bizarre that our even our candidates have sort of lost their grounding i think i guess that's why i'm i'm, a, I'm hopeful for us in our roles as columnists yeah. because we're allowed to bring a viewpoint to this and we're allowed to call them out when it's getting ridiculous and i certainly hear from campaigns when i do that and i know they can be very sensitive to it and if you and then if you post in forums where readers can participate in a civil discussion which is why i started the facebook forum seven years ago because the you know these are cesspools on news news sites yeah nobody wants to wait in there if you want to hear from thoughtful readers start moderating the comments and then candidates start paying attention and i'm hoping that's something we can do i'm more. looking forward to this. Is it Scott Brown? Who's, uh, no, um, who's coming back to New Hampshire next, very soon, to ride on a Harley Davidson? Walker. Oh, Walker. Sweet. Scott Walker and, and Scott Brown on a Harley Davidson because Scott that'll Brown prove something. Too, probably. You know, manhood, I guess. We're going to have know. the easiest jobs in the country. <laughs> I know, so, we have the best jobs in the country. So we're, we, we are on a bit of a tight schedule, so I want to close with this. How should we 
how should the media decide how tomorrow night's, and I say decide, you know, this idea, but the collective, there will be this collective assumption of who did well and who didn't. How will it be done? Will it be based on zingers, based on body language? Karen, what do you think it's going With to be? that many people on the stage, and this is going to sound like a terrible thing to, to say, it's going to be zingers and gaffes. Mm -hmm. And it is going to be who grabs the moment or moments, maybe two or three of them, that people are still talking about the next day. Are you going to learn anything about these people? I suggest probably not. All right, before I go down the line and ask everything, and where, by the time your Washington Post story is filed, it's re, you know, sort of added to and all this stuff, how much of the first debate do you think will be in that story? Um, how much of the first debate? Yeah. We are doing separate stories on the first debate, and also it's like the, the print paper is, it's the tail, it's not the dog anymore. No, I understand that, but in the big story about the debate, oh. the first, you know, about the big event in Cleveland, right. will the first debate get like a, also attending were, or, you know? No, but, but there will be, a, in the, into the evening, there will be, when it's still fresh, plenty. I, 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 I remember I, wrote, I was in 24 press files last cycle, wrote 24 <laughs> debate rap stories, and both my own and others, I, half an hour, one hour into a two hour debate, leads were written, stories were already flowing. Rick Perry could have made news in the last, you know, unless, except for Oops. Oops came in the second hour of that debate. But no, Oops was early. Really? I was in the control room for that because I remember oh, CNBC debate. the debate yeah. was going, the debate was just like the, the executives are going, this is not very lively, nothing's happening. Oops happened and I said, you got your lead. <laughs> it doesn't matter what it is anymore. We know what this debate's going to be known. How do you think we'll do it and how should it be done? I'll tell you how I'm going to do it. I'm going to host a, we're going to be on Facebook and I'm going to get um, live reaction from people. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to tell them ahead of time, we can't make fun of them. Yeah, just make, I want to see what you're thinking about what they're saying. And that's, Twitter, it's journalists talking to other journalists a lot. And I go there for breaking news. I want to hear from people who are actually watching the debate and see what they think. And then I'll decide what I thought based on their reactions in part. Well, I, yeah, I, I never know what I'm going to do, but I have to write a column for Sunday tomorrow uh, before noon on Friday. So I, prob I think I'm going to, as a fan of underdogs, I'm probably going to cover the, the baby debate. How does it not end up being, I mean, I just think about how, I know how my producers are going to think at the different shows, and it's going to be, well, how did Trump do? Like, the tele television story That's is going to end up being way. some form of Trump or how people played off of him. Isn't that going to Wouldn't be it be a fun story to write and not mention him? <laughs> to try it. Well, to no, somebody I mean, should try it. Just to show what everyone else said. Well, someone and should follow Bobby Jindal around tomorrow. Just we'll spend the day Oh, that'd him. be fun, too, yeah. Or whatever, no. someone who's not going to get any attention. Right. It, it, like, what are you doing today? I suggested to our folks, I said, you know what I'd love to have? ISO cameras on every candidate so that any you could actually, as a viewer, decide, I only want to watch John Kasich. Because yeah. I want to see his facial expression. That would get as tens other of viewers. No, but you do it for everyone. In the same way, if you want to watch a football game, you get to watch it from the different points of view. Yeah, yeah, now, yeah, if you yeah, go online, yeah. Yeah. should we be doing that with the debates? And everybody will be watching Trump. Everybody will be, and then that's the story. <laughs> well, there you go. I'm hearing from my progressive contingency here in Ohio. No. They're not at all certain. Yeah, no, are, I, I, all, I, I can just tell you, we get, be, with the web, we get minute-by-minute minute feedback. Yep as to what people want to read about, and Donald Trump is catnip. Yeah. Worst thing yes. to happen, welcome, <laughs> can I just tell you, welcome to the criticism that television got 20 years ago. Television's being driven by ratings. Oh, it is worse that's interesting. on digital, isn't it? That's oh, a really good, yes. we're all it's in it now. worse on digital, everybody is driven by ratings. Mm -hmm. You have one more word? I'm well, gonna no, I was shut just it gonna down. say, the one other thought I've had about Trump is that he reminds me of Sarah Palin in this respect. His re the reaction to him and to her uh, has been, look, we don't care that she doesn't know anything. We don't care that he doesn't have any policy ideas. We just like the way they talk, you know? And of course, with her, the way she winked, right? <laughs> you just wanted to do that. Well, I hadn't thought of it. Well, all right. I would have worn my red shoes if I had. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> On that note, uh, thanks very much. Thanks to a great panel, Karen, Peter. Connie, Kathleen. Thank you.